to be exposed to some new ideas, to new people, and find inspiration for your own work in your community, and to connect at a much deeper level. That was part of the, the inspiration behind this summit. And one of the people that I want to introduce you to is Judith Smith, and she has earned an international reputation in the field of physically integrated dance. She's the artistic director for Access Dance Company, and she also um, has dance access for adults and kids. And so I, I can't wait for you to hear more about her. So welcome, Judy. Thank you for coming. Oh, thank you for having me on. So I'd love for people to know a little bit about you, why you do the work you do, and then talk about Access Dance Company. Well, um, I actually uh, never thought that this was what I would be doing with my life, but I was um, an equestrian. I rode jumping horses growing up, and I was injured in a car accident when I was 17. And of course, that kind of dramatically altered my plans um, for having an equestrian career. And at the time, I was living in Colorado, and after about five Colorado winters, because we actually used to have winter back then, um, <laughs> I was injured about 38 years ago. Um, I moved out to Berkeley at the suggestion of a friend, and I just managed to find myself um, doing improvisational movement with a friend, and that led me into martial arts, which led me into dance. And so, you know, it, I don't have a dance background. It's It's not something I would have ever imagined doing. But I was used to being really physical and being really active and, you know, inhabiting my body. And it was nice to find a way to do that. Um, it actually changed my life to find a way to do that, you know, as a disabled woman. Um, when we started Access Dance Company, it was started by a woman named Thais Mazur, who was a dancer and was interested in extending her dance practice to people with disabilities. Um, we really just got the, together with the idea of doing one dance piece for a, a dance festival here in Oakland, California, where we're based. And um, what happened was we all really got hooked on what we were doing. And you have to understand this was in 1987, and this was before the internet. So. You know, we didn't know anyone else that was doing what we were doing, that was actually setting choreography on a cast of dancers with and without physical disabilities. We did find out, you know, a few years in that there were other companies um, in the country and around the world, and it seemed like this form of dance was popping up kind of all over at about the same time. Very interesting. Yeah. Go ahead. And I, uh, well, I just I feel like it was really a reflection of what was happening in dance. We were, we're coming out of the Judson Church movement and postmodern dance, and you know, looking at pedestrian movement and dance in alternative venues and on different bodies, and you know, people with disabilities were also gaining a little bit more access to the community um, worldwide, especially here in the United States and in Europe. OK, uh, so tell us how many dancers are in your troupe, and, and how does that work? And uh, you know, are these people who were trained in dance, or do you have, quote, civilians who, who you know are part of your ensemble? How does that work? People like me who are non-dancers. Um, well, Access Dance Company, as I said, started kind of as an experiment. But what happened was the dance community got hooked on what we were doing, and the disability community did too. And we just kept getting offers to make work. At the same time, people would come to us and say, where can I learn to do this? And we had nowhere to send them. So we started doing education programming really early on. Um, but our dance company has uh, used to be more um, a larger company of about seven to ten dancers, but because of the economy and the fact that we're actually paying people now, we pay our dancers, um, 
we've been uh, more like at the five to six numbers, and our dancers come to us in various ways. Most of our non-disabled dancers have a lot of dance experience and have danced their entire lives. Some of our disabled dancers um, have been dancers prior to becoming injured or disabled. Um, others are, like myself, are new to dance. It's very difficult as a disabled person to get any training in dance. So, you know, most of our, our training, I know my training was on the job training, and a lot of our dancers come through our classes and our workshops and our summer intensives. Um, okay. How, how do you get funding for this, and who are some of your community partners to support this? Because this is important work, but it, it sounds like you need a lot of collaboration to, to get this, you know, message out. Well, it is important work, and I, I want to say that, you know, AXIS, where A-X-I-S, not A-C-C-E-S-S, AXIS stands company, you know, our um, mission is really to change the face of dance and disability. And, you know, we do that through performing and through creating work and through education work and um, through advocacy work, which I'm taking a, a bigger role in now, um, now that I'm, you know, have been doing this for 38 years. Um, and I Can you talk a little bit about that? I, I know you had a conference in May, so if you want to share a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, AXIS is one of the pioneers and one of the leaders in physically integrated dance, which is what we, we call this, for lack of a better term. AXIS is actually a contemporary dance company, but we do physically integrated work. So um, that means that we have dancers with and without physical disabilities. And, you know, the field has been going. AXIS is in its 29th year. Um, other companies are a little bit older than us. We're kind of like the first, second, and third generation. And, you know, I, um, having grown up in this field and having, having helped grow the field, you know, I have seen that things have changed in the last 29 years, um, especially with the ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act, and, you know, with accessibility being mandated. But a lot of things haven't changed. It's still very difficult to get training as a disabled dancer. It's difficult as a non-disabled dancer to find a way to do this work. And, you know, there's still not um, a lot of people that, that know about it and know that it, it exists. So um, we did a national, I, I kind of cooked up this little project um, to do a national convening. It's the first one ever on physically integrated dance. We got support from Doris Duke Charitable Foundation and we brought um, almost 60 stakeholders from the field, um, both from physically integrated dance, other companies, um, other dancers. Um, we had funders, presenters, service organizations. Um, we had some scholars there. Um, but really, you know, just uh, kind of it, it was a two and a half day think tank to see what is working in the field, what isn't working, and really what came out of that two and a half days, which will be followed up by six regional convenings, one of which will be in Chicago. Um, we'll have to publicize it. Do you know when that's going to be? Yes, I believe that it's going to be October 1st. But... You know, really, I just, there's, the UK, the United Kingdom, is so far ahead of the U.S. in terms of um, integrating disabled arts and disabled artists really into the cultural fabric of the UK, and I think it's a reflection of the fact that their country is smaller, um, you know, they have government funding, but they just have such a wonderful model that I really wanted to bring um, somebody over from the UK to tell the convening participants about what was happening in the UK and see if there's ways that we can replicate it here in the US. And so the national convening was kind of the first step and then we'll have these regional meetings and 
see if we can kind of organize as regions because we're such a big country. But, you know, that was really the first time we had all been in the room together. And again, so what I, did you what did you come away with? What are some of your big takeaways from this? Other than you need to be smaller, and and you you decide to have these regional pieces. Well, we don't need to be smaller. We need to organize smaller. Okay. You know, kind of think regionally and act nationally. Well, really, uh, we did a pre conference survey, and what really came to light was the fact that there are not training opportunities for disabled dancers. That um, there aren't. Uh, training opportunities for choreographers who want to work with integrated casts. There's not very many opportunities to do that. And there's also no kind of national network where we can stay connected and keep connected and, you know, know about each other's work. You know, the UK has dozens of disability arts festivals and conferences and you know, we don't really have very much here at all. So um, that's, you know, I think it was just kind of that first step to get in the same room. You have to identify what are some of the challenges and what are the gaps mm -hmm. before you can solve yeah. them. And I think yeah. that's so much what creative activists do, you know, whether you're convening this or, I, you know, I, I'm feeling that same way. And I know my personal mission is to connect one million creative activists, to enable, to find a way to connect them as a community to support each other, just like you're talking about. Because, you know, even in small communities, I, I, my personal passion is about um, – making the world safe for women and children and ending abuse across the lifeline. So there's a woman here in Chicago who I've worked with, Mary Bonnet, and she's created several different plays on sex trafficking. And so smaller communities could then have access to that and know that it exists. You don't have to create it. You don't have to start over it. You just need to contact her. So that's the kind of thing I'd like to be, you know, um, initiating and that's part of the reason I'm having this summit because just like you're saying I feel too many times artists you know and I'm using that loosely you know creatives are working in a vacuum they aren't connecting in a way that that could benefit them all well and that definitely came out in the convening is that you know we all do feel like we're isolated because you know there's you know 50 60 70 80 100 depending on where you are dance companies in a community, but they're not um, a lot of us doing physically integrated work. So we are pretty isolated. And, you know, I think a lot of people do feel like they're just operating in a vacuum. Um, and probably not only in our field, but in, you know. Oh, right. It, uh, it definitely is across the board. You know, anybody who's doing activism in this kind of, whether it, it is for, you know, um, for disabled or if it's sustainability or if it's anything, you know, or if it's gender equality, everybody sort of feels isolated. And that, that's what's come out of my conversations with people. And, and I'm hoping to change that by, you know, somebody hearing you, they can reach out and say, wow, let, let me, you know, I want you to come to my community. Let's see what we can do together. And when we're done with this call, I need to hook you up with somebody in Chicago, a couple people that I know. So <laughs> they can probably well, help with what you're doing. Well, and I think that's, I mean, one of the things that I've been really aware of, as I said, I've been in this field, you know, for 28 years, is, you know, disability gets, has got left out of the discussion of multiculturalism in the 90s, diversity in the early 2000s, and now it's getting mostly left out of the discussion of equity. And, um, you know, disability and, uh, is the largest minority, and, you know, anybody can join it at any time. So, you know, I think one of the advocacy things that ACCESS is trying to do and that we do through DAN, you know, I've done so much educating with presenters in this country and with service organizations and um, with funders, but, you know, there just needs to be a broader inclusion. You know, we need to think beyond just race and class. And right. um, the question is, who's not at the table instead of... Yeah, and, yeah. and disabled people are often not. More often than not, they're, you know, a, a second thought or, you know, not thought about at all until one of us pounds on the door. So, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that's been really challenging. Um, 
you know, through the years. I mean, just getting people to understand that what we were doing was art. We weren't doing therapy, you know, and we wanted to be considered um, as a dance company and we wanted to be reviewed critically and, you know, there there was a lot of confusion about what we were doing early on and it wasn't until um, I started commissioning outside choreographers, including Bill T. Jones, Stephen Petronio, um, we worked with Meredith Monk, you know, really uh, names in contemporary dance that, you know, critics found a way to review what we were doing. They, you know, outside of just saying, isn't it nice that those people are doing that? They could review us in the context of what they knew about Bill T. Jones' work or, you know, and it lent um, their names and the work. Well, the work got better for one thing. I mean, our, our artistic work got so much stronger um, working with outside choreographers. But, you know, the fact that these people were considering what we were doing to be dance you know, kind of woke the rest of, you know, the funding community and the presenting community to the fact that, yeah, we were really um, acting and wanted to be taken seriously as a dance company. I love that. That's great. So I, I'm going to ask you something a little bit more personal now. So let's talk about your own creative process. Mm -hmm. How you know you you are you know being you've been a choreographer a teacher you how are you doing that what is, what is your own process about Yeah, I don't consider myself a choreographer. I have okay. some pieces, you know. But my the fun part of my job is that I get to curate the repertory, and I have had that opportunity for the last um, eighteen or nineteen years. Um, you know, and so, I, you know, the way I educated myself about dance was to go see everything I could possibly see. And that's when I started seeing choreographers um, locally, like Joe Good, Sonia Delwade, um, Alex Kettley, that, you know, I saw their work and I thought, man, they could do something so interesting with us, you know. And so for me, I, I love um, kind of thinking about the repertory and thinking about, what we need as a company and the cast of dancers that I have, you know, what kind of choreography is appropriate for them because when the cast changes, our choreography often has to change. You know, we're not like a ballet company that you can just plug a new dancer into. You know, right. our dancers are very, very individual and there's not a lot, especially physically disabled dancers. So. You know, I have had some repertory pieces that I've been able to keep going for years and through different casts and other ones that, you know, I just haven't had the right cast to do again. But, I, you know, for me, the, the creative process is really figuring out, you know, with, this, with the particular dancers that I have at the moment and the choreographers that I'm interested in bringing in um, and what repertory already exists, you know, what do we need? It's fun to curate that, you know, and to kind of figure that puzzle out. And, you know, sometimes I'm able to even connect the choreographer with the composer that I like. Um, but, you know, that's, for me, the fun, the fun thing is just, uh, and the creativity um, and my process is really about, you know, putting together a really vibrant and diverse repertory because that's the fun thing about being a rep company is that our pieces don't all look alike. And, um, you know, we've done everything from aerial work to um, site-specific work to dance theater work with text and singing. Um, we restaged an iconic uh, postmodern dance piece, Yvonne Rayner's Trio A. It was the first time it had ever been done, you know, on uh, disabled dancers. So, you know, that's for me where um, the creative juice is, is really just trying to find that right combination of um, repertory pieces and, you know, dancers that fit, the, fit, fit that vision. Okay, so what is your what is your vision for the future? What is it that you would like to see uh, happen? Um, for your, go ahead. Personally, for me, I am um, transitioning to 
a hopefully in the next year to a founder role um, where I will be dealing more with um, I have a more external facing role um, dealing more with advocacy and national initiatives, regional initiatives, um, mentoring, and we are looking to bring on new artistic direction with a new artistic director, and we'll be working on that and hopefully. Okay, did I lose you? Okay, I lost you for a second. So oh. I, I I heard you say um, looking for new artistic direction, and then it went blank. <laughs> oh, that's weird. I don't know why. Um, okay. Yeah, we're to bring on a new artistic director, and I'm hoping that we have some great news about that um, in the next few months. You know, for Axis, um, you know, we are a national leader in this field, and. I want to continue finding ways to um, strengthen our infrastructure and, you know, bolster up our, bolster up our artistic staff. Um, we do, you know, we've, we've had a lot of touring um, and, you know, it's time to grow the company a little bit. You know, for the field, I, I really want the field to continue to develop and for um, the quality of the work to get better, for there to be more opportunities. For dancers who are disabled, I would love to see a university take on um, developing a physically integrated dance degree or emphasis of some sort. And there's, you know, some things that are happening around that. So, you know, it's I, a wonderful I, legacy you're thinking about. I love it. Yeah, and I mean, it's so it's important. Yeah. Uh, I want to know. This is a question I happen to love, like. So you think you can dance, and what it's done for dance, and and just the idea that in in a two minute dance you can express so much, you know, and you can tell a story. And how do you feel about that? And and having you know dance being front and center on some level. And they have like National Dance Day, and how could you participate well, in something like that? Yeah, it's interesting because we've had the opportunity to be. Um, guest artists on So You Think You Can Dance Twice. And, you know, the, that getting that kind of exposure is impossible for a company our size. Um, and I think any uh, dance is, you know, dance is one of those um, kind of ancient art forms that is just a birthright for everybody, but there are people that get excluded from it or you know, not even with disabilities, but just with different bodies who are told they're to this to be a, a dancer or to that or... Um, Bad feet, too fat, too, yeah, too short, exactly, whatever. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. exactly. And, you know, dance is just kind of an inalienable human right as far as I'm concerned. Um, you know, and I think it's great the more that we can get exposure in the media and um, you know, for physically integrated for dan dance, for dance in general, you know, the more that kids are able to take dance and express themselves through movement, you know, we're, we just grow up so um, hung up in our bodies, you know, and, and dance is just so freeing. Um, I know for myself, I was very disconnected from my body for so long. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I've been sexually assaulted and, you know, as a child. And so that, I just, you know, my body was my enemy, you know. And then I started taking, uh, I, the first time I really exposed myself to dance was um, Daria Halperin of Tampa Institute. I took a one-day workshop mm -hmm. with her. And it was like, Oh my, you know, it was like, and for me it worked well because they had you do poetry and art as well, you know, so it wasn't just straight dance, but it was exhausting for me to, to but it, it, it was exhausting, but at the same time enlivening because I never really, you know, used my body in that way or expressed myself that way. So I, I, I it is, it's a gift, you know, and we do take it for granted many times. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it, I think that, you know, art and nature and animals are the things that heal people. And, you know, that's the thing I love. I, I'm kind of an activist at heart. And, you know, I, I grew up riding horses. Now I rescue thoroughbred race horses. You know, I love art for art's sake, but it wouldn't satisfy me. 
and I wouldn't be able to work as hard as I've had to work to grow this company for something that I didn't feel had some bigger purpose. And I just feel like the work that Axis and other companies like us do is so important in gaining visibility for, you know, people with disabilities and for dance and, um, you know, it, it's, it's a dance form that really has the ability to change people's minds and to change people's lives. And, you know, when you get to experience that and um, get to experience the impact that your work has, you know, it can be a really motivating force, you know, when you've been working on grant proposals all week or, you know, I mean, it's running a dance company and, and being in the dance field, you know, is just not for the meek. <laughs> oh, yeah, it sounds that way. There's a, there's, I think anybody who's, who is working, you know, to create change on such a broad scale that you are and working to you know because you are dependent on funders and you know this this is yes i mean this is this is huge work and that's why i'm so glad you're here talking about these things because people need to know what does it take so what is one tip or, or tool or technique you use to break through your own creative blocks oh i get i get out in nature i mean i'm constantly inspired by nature um you know or i just get in the studio and move I mean, that's the thing is that, you know, you can always move through a block. And sometimes the, I don't get to dance as much as I used to. Um, but, you know, sometimes when you're feeling the most blocked and the most like you don't want to move, after you do, you feel the best. I love that. So yeah. I, I, I want to ask you about uh, if somebody – wants to get started in the dance field and wants to, you know, get a hold of you and find out more about you, how do they how do they do that? Well they can go to our website, which is um www.axisdance.org, dot org, accessdance dot org. Access Dance Company is on Facebook and we're on Twitter and blog and YouTube and Instagram, you know, and all of all of those. Um if they want to get a hold of me personally, I'm kind of known for answering every email I get, um, which, uh, you know, I just I feel like it's an important part of the work to, you know, respond. Um, and I can be reached at Judy at AccessDance.org. Oh, fabulous. Do you have any final thoughts for people? How can they get... Uh, involved in the advocacy piece of this? Do you have, you know, so ta so often people feel helpless, you know, or what can one person do? And so do you have any suggestions? Well, if you're on a board of directors, make sure that you are instigating, um, diversifying your board to include people with disabilities. If you are running arts programs, find out how you can make them accessible. Um, physically and programmatically for people with disabilities. You know, if you're um, putting on a an event or a conference or a performance, make sure that it's accessible. It's in a wheelchair accessible space um, that you are able to supply um, interpreters if necessary. You know, there's just so many little things that can be done. And, you know, we all kind of laugh in the disability community, you know, about the little wheelchair access symbol, because really it's the law that things are supposed to be accessible. And I feel like what people should need to know is when they're not, not when they are. You right. know, but it's just still so much that isn't accessible that we do, we do need that. We need to know it. But I just, you know, and call things out, you know, if, you're going to a dance studio that is up a flight of stairs. Ask them why, you know. I love that. Thank you. I think that's what's so important is everybody can do something. Absolutely. And you break it down in taking small baby steps. And when we do that, I think that's how we build momentum. We create that ripple effect and we create awareness. 
And I think mm-hmm. by the conversation we're having today, I think you are going to open up so many hearts and minds to, wow, I didn't even think that was possible, you know, that I because so many people have never heard of a, a dance company that works with disabled people. I, I, you know, I've talked to several people, really? Oh, I didn't know that existed. So I think that's fabulous what you're doing. And I want to thank you for being on our call today. I, I so appreciate it. Well, thank you so much. And I really appreciate being included. And you know, thank you for including disability. <laughs> you know, well, what you're doing. Thank you. I, you know, again, it's one of those things we have to find ways to talk about this, and it's an array of subjects. You know, there's so many things going on in the world that cause distress, and and we need to be open and create awareness. And so that's what we're doing. And to everybody who's listening, please make some notes. What can you do? Take one action step. Think about the ideas that Judy just talked about and see, you know, when you're out and about, see who doesn't have access or why is, you know, what's going on in that place and and think about the dance companies that you see and start thinking about that. And I would also like to remind you that if you are a gold member, you're going to be able to stream and download both the audio seminar, you know, the, this call, and the transcript day by day for your permanent library. And there will be some additional bonus calls going on uh, that I want to keep it, you know, keep you in touch with. So thank you so much for being part of this today, Judy. And we will talk again. Great, thank you.